wild prickly pear, the thorny one, invaded south of Grafnit. The infestation of prickly pear in the Karoo was not to be expected, I don't think. Their seeds were very widely spread. It was absolutely choked with prickly pear. And the prickly pears were so tall, I could only think of cathedrals. It actually was forestation to them. You couldn't penetrate it. The prickly pear was a very dangerous development. It's actually a puzzle to, it was a puzzle to me until I thought it out exactly how the prickly pear managed to spread so quickly in a relatively short time. But it's not so difficult to understand because one farmer would have prickly pear and his neighbour would visit him and enjoy the fruit and he would say, oh goodness, give me a few leaves, would you please? And of course, in that way, it was quite quickly spread all over the country. When it arrived in the Eastern Cape, it found the perfect habitat and, and started spreading. My uncle owned 40,000 hectares and probably at least 30,000 of it was infested with prickly pear. There was a group of farmers, mainly up in the Upper Karoo. You were one of them. How did you regard it as a, as a menace, as a pest? We, we regarded it as a most enormous pest. These thickets would have amounted to about 50% of the total. There was an awful lot of it. The thickets of prickly pear were 50 to 100 meters in diameter, and you couldn't get into them at all. The prickly pears were at its, at its densest and widest around about 1938. Uh, there were campaigns where they tried to control it mechanically, chopping it out, piling it on heaps and burning it. So they tried with herbicides, but this caused enormous mortalities in, in the stock. Also the applicators started getting serious health problems. It, it was very obvious, it was not the solution. Uh, they cleared a few areas, but the regrowth was so fast that in a few years they were back to, back to square one. It, it ju just wasn't sustainable. The catalyst that took us to biological control eventually was the history of a similar project in Australia. Australia had as big a problem as we had, but with another cactus, and they solved it with biological controls. Biological control is simple that we are using the natural enemies of a plant or an insect to keep it under control in a, in a sustainable way. Biological control of prickly pear depended on two insects. Uh, firstly, the cochineal, and secondly, the cactoblastis moth. The moth lays its eggs on top of each other in the form of a thorn, to imitate the thorn. Those eggs hatch in about uh, uh, three or four weeks, and then they enter uh, the leaf pad. There are about 50, 60 larvae in here. When, when they mature, they can really do a lot of damage. Biological control was successful uh, in, in our definition, definitely, because it reduced those very, very dense uh, infestations over large areas. I had the opportunity to really see prickly pear in Mexico, in its natural habitat, but I was also able to see what the Mexicans are doing with the plant. And I think that is something that really opened my eyes, that is a very versatile plant. It can be used for so many things, from eating as a green vegetable, to fodder, to fruit. And then you have a huge medicinal market in, in Mexico around prickly pear. It's, it's amazing what they can do with prickly pear. And we are, we are not even touching those things. We are only eating it as a fruit.
Mm-mm. Breakfast. Breakfast, yeah. Breakfast. <laughs> yeah. I really try to convince the locals to eat prickly pear as a fresh vegetable. To me, that was a challenge. But now we're going to try and eat this one. Very good for the stomach, very healthy. Show you how to clean it. In Mexico, you will find the young leaf pads, they call them nopalitos. This is very, very healthy. Very healthy. It has a very high status as a fresh vegetable and it is actually highly nutritious. You must remember that there are only few of these really heavy infestations left in the country. But I think we must regard these isolated patches of infestations as, as orchards. I have lived in the Eastern Cape for 15 years and I've been in the research of invasive alien species and it's amazing how new species suddenly emerge that you haven't seen before. There are various other cactuses which uh, I see about the place here which were kept as ornamental plants which are now cropping up in the field. During the last, I would say, 30 years there has been a new wave of cactus invaders coming into this country. Our present activities uh, focus around identifying potential new invaders. The initiative in identifying and controlling these new invaders is mainly done now by the Department of Environmental Affairs, more particular South African National Biodiversity Institute. Can you say, we've been, we've been looking at this whole environment around Crafternet. This whole area here was one big mass of prickly pears yeah. 80 years ago. We have restored the Karoo vegetation to its yeah, original it state, cold. more or less. But now we have other invaders coming in now, new species, also cacti. And we want to prevent another prickly pear disaster. Yeah. As we walked around today, we saw that Tosh cactus is becoming quite widespread in the area. I mean, do, you, do you think we're getting back to history? When we have the information and the data, then we, we will have to make a, a, a decision on, on whether to eradicate it and go in for the rapid response program. We certainly do not want a second prickly pear uh, invasion. And this is what the early detection and rapid response program of, of the South African National Biodiversity Institute is in fact doing. We have identified a new uh, unlisted invasive species and it's been shown to be a threat. Then the early detection rapid response moves in with their teams and controlling. This plant is known as a thistle chola. It's now known as one of the emerging invaders in South Africa. It's spreading quite fast, so it's quite a potential damage to our biodiversity and our agricultural lands. These cladots that you see detach easily and they can just fall on the ground and form a new plant. Our early detection program is actually detect the plant. We chemically treat the plant to manage the population. Our aim is to eradicate the population. We believe that we should cooperate and work much more closely with the nurseries. We know that the majority of invasive species in this country uh, originated from nurseries. Probably near a thousand cactus species in the nursery trade. We have many species out in the gardens, many of these ready to jump the fence. We have cases where a cactus uh, is widely permitted and it's being sold by nurseries because they are sterile, because the claim is that they don't produce seeds. And if a plant doesn't produce seeds, normally it doesn't spread that fast or, or effectively. But what we have seen, this can change. They suddenly start producing seeds, whereas in the past for many years they haven't produced seeds. Now we certainly have changed from a 
an innocent cactus invader now suddenly has changed to an aggressive cactus invader. So, so we have to be aware of all these things that can happen. You know, we mustn't see and stare out plant necessary as innocent. This is a combined effort between, I would say, the researchers and the nursery trade. We've got to get together and go through the list of species that are being sold in the nursery trade and see and identify those that are likely to become invasive. Some years after the prickly pear had been eradicated, my father and this McNaughton uncle of mine were talking, and Mr. McNaughton said, you know, the pear did a lot of good too. It, it uh, preserved speckworm and it preserved other bush. And my father said to him, do you want it back? And he said, no. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, there were benefits, but the, the, the harm, the disadvantages far outweighed the benefits.